the bit at sea. For more, Jonathan Sheridan live from FIG in Sydney. Jonathan, it's a nuanced distinction. Just walk me through it. Possibility v probability. Good afternoon, Carson. Yeah, look, I think the comments were veiled as usual, but very strongly pointed towards the fact that they will start in December. We also had uh, another Fed board member, Lockhart, who has been uh, relatively dovish come around to the, the uh, situation being also in favour of a, a potential hike, where he said his estimates look like that a hike would be reasonable in, in these circumstances as long as we start to see a bit more wage tightening. So we've got another payrolls number coming up soon. And, and if mm. the wages component of that shows any kind of strength, then I think uh, that will be the final nail in the coffin mm. of the zero interest rate policy. She's testifying before a joint congressional committee as of Thursday on the US economic outlook. How is she likely to characterise things there? I think pretty much the same as uh, she said in her press conference overnight that, mm. you know, they see things be, uh, heading towards their their goals, uh, you know, the 2% inflation being the main one and, and further wage growth that uh, they're expecting. So I don't think she'll say anything different. You know, it's been on message for a long time now and uh, that seems to be the way that we're headed. And, and I think actually that'll be good for markets because this is probably the single biggest uh, risk mm. point in markets that we've got at the moment. And, uh, you know, we need to get that out of the way. She made the remark that holding the Fed funds rate at the current level for too long could also encourage excessive risk-taking and undermine financial stability. Uh, is that not sort of like a remark after the horses bolted? Very much so, yes. Uh, I think we're, we're well down that path. If you look at the, the average trailing PE of the US stock market, it's around 23 times. Uh, you know, it's only been there twice in history, which uh, ended badly both times in, in 1929 and 2001. So we obviously would rather not have an outcome uh, such as we had after those dates. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely, as you say, the horse has bolted. But we need to close the stable door pretty carefully this time. Mm -hmm. we, we need to, and, and you know, we need to keep things as stable as possible. They're well aware of that. They probably could have gone earlier, but were concerned about what might happen overseas, and particularly emerging markets with all that US dollar debt that's out there. Uh, which is obviously getting more expensive as the dollar appreciates. So how do you close the door carefully on that EM story? Uh, I just I think that you had, have to be measured and you know they've spent probably 12 to 18 months preparing markets for this eventuality so that's something that will be an ongoing theme I think the pace of rate rises will be gradual so as to give markets a lot of time to adjust gradually and, and not provide shocks I think you know financial stability is is one of the mandates of central banks around the world and, and that will be a very key one that they'll be focused on this time around. Uh, any surprises in that uh, yield higher story overnight as a result uh, looking at the, uh, the two year and the ten year? No, not really. I mean, I think we're just, as I said, pricing in uh, much more of a firm chance of the, of the rate hike happening in December. That's being seen in the short end of the curve, as you say, the five, uh, sorry, the two-year getting to five-year highs. Um, I think the long end of the curve is being held down by the ECB action, though. You know, we're still seeing very muted inflation numbers and growth numbers out of there, and, and Draghi's prepared to, you know, find another another barrel to unleash at the at the tepid eurozone economy. Mm. So I think the long end of the curve is being held down by what's happening in the eurozone, but the short end definitely preparing for that official rate hike. Do you think she's? I mean, it's interesting you say that because you. You could argue there's a point of commonality between their quest on inflation, Janet's remarks that she anticipates economic growth on track to meet their own inflation targets. But Barclays has said overnight, look, unless you get a sub 4% unemployment print, you are going to struggle over the long term to meet the 2% inflation target. Yeah, look, I mean, they, they're obviously much more into the detail of the numbers than I am. Mm. I'm, you know, more in the, in the markets per se, but um, they've obviously run their, their models with certain assumptions. Uh, mm. We know that headline unemployment is not necessarily a, a hugely reliable indicator of the state of the of tightness in, in the labour market. We here at Abfig prefer to look at the uh, underemployment statistics, uh, the U6, and that's still relatively high comparatively uh, to the rest of history. So, mm. look, it's certainly... A, a valid point to make that headline unemployment probably should be lower if you're going to get that inflation because you know you need tighten, uh, tightened conditions in labour and also in prices for, for that to happen so uh, I don't think it's it's unreasonable for them to say that but I don't think anyone is is uh, realising that we're at where they want to be right now it's that we're approaching it and they know that they need to raise rates 
gradually and therefore they don't want the shock of having to have an overheated economy and raise rates too fast. Very, very briefly, your BAL 3, we kind of, I thought we'd moved on to BAL 4, but you're saying BAL 3 alive and well when it comes to uh, sub-debt issuance domestically. What kind of uh, pipeline are we looking at here before we then trans, uh, we transfer into BAL 4? So really BAL 3 was just the driver about having these non-viability clauses in uh, the issuance in lower tier 2 and, and additional tier 1 capital. So it's still relevant from, from that point in that that was the jumping off to, to get these non-viability clauses included. They're becoming much more standardised across the market now and we've seen a fair bit of issuance in that level uh, replacing old non-compliant bonds. So that, that's the key thing here is that we had old issues that were coming up for maturity and or call dates in the sub-debt space and they've been refinanced with the compliant uh, non-viability issues and we've seen Vero uh, or the old Vero sorry the AAI group from Suncorp come to the market recently with a, a, a hybrid uh, sorry a lower tier 2 at 3.30 over now trading in at about 3.10 and ANZ launched a, a six-year non-call at 2.70 over about a week and a half ago which is trading strongly in at 2.60 over so both uh, trading above their issue prices showing that there's strong demand even with these non-viability clauses. Nicely put, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carson. Right. Jonathan Sheridan from FIG.